welcome everyone. Uh, this is this is in the eighth segment of the CRPD course. We're very happy to have a guest lecturer, Janice Cambry from the Philippines, and this is her bio. Janice Cambry, MA, is a survivor of psychiatry and the founder of Psychosocial Disability Inclusive Philippines. She is a member of Psoriasis, Psoriasis Philippines, Anxiety and Depression Support Philippines, and TCI Asia Pacific. She is the first CRPD-inspired person with psychosocial disability, self-advocate, and representative of the sector recognized by the national government. Since 2014, she has been serving as a resource speaker in disability sensitivity trainings. She has been a leftist activist for 19 years. She is a former English professor, call center trainer, and program host. And she gives some links. I'm going to put, there's links to her organizations and also to a blog post on the Mad in Asia website um, on Mad in the Philippines. So I'm sharing those links in the chat log, um, and I will make sure to share them in other places also where, where we put this, the, the recording of this presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to Janice now. We're going to be screen sharing her slides, and um, I'm going to take off my webcam so it's not distracting. Okay, Janet, go ahead, please. Hi, everyone. Janet, it's Janet, Janet sorry. sorry. Yes, sorry, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Good evening from the Philippines. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I formatted the lecture for today in uh, to answer three of the questions posed by Tina. Number one is the struggle in the Philippines. And number two, how it was that the Philippines didn't have a mental health law for the longest time. And uh, how was our fight against it and how to get the changes made. Um, with the first, um, when I think of mental health issues, whether they're about cause, treatment, or prevention, I go back to the fundamentals. And I guess because my background is activism, so I look at the socioeconomic determinants. Much of the Philippine problems rely on it being a semi-feudal, semi-colonial society and having a government which is not for the people. We never achieved genuine independence we have remained a neo-colony, particularly of the United States, and a slave to other foreign capitalist country masters, which undermine our development and buries us into poverty. Uh, the Philippines is a good example how globalization ruins a country. We have a system that sets up the citizens for failure. We have massive disparity between the rich and the poor, with the country's wealth being concentrated in the hands of 100 families. Our government, past and present, has always been corrupt and never been interested in making social services accessible, whether they're health, education, or never been interested in building self-sustaining economy, which results to 10% of our population migrating, and we know what the social implication of the diaspora is usually. Our education and justice systems are a failure. Um, we live in a culture of impunity. It also does not help that we are a natural disaster prone nation. And sometimes even if we have little to do with things like climate change, we bear the full brunt of it. But, but I, I do not wish to dwell on this lengthily. I have written an article about it, which I share with you. Um, the bottom line is our government is and our system is 
the top breeder of mental distress in psychosocial visibility in the country. And it's still a long way for my people to analyze mental health and disability through this lens. And of course, almost impossible for the bureaucracy that thrives on the system to, to end sufferings. That's why um, in discussions about mental health, they are always still seeing it within the, the, the medical model. You know, the, the problem is the mind is broken. It's an individual's fault. It's nothing to do with what's going on. Or if there is, it's, it's minor, just because you are more susceptible trauma and everything um, but I don't I don't see it that way um, anyway so how it was that we didn't have a mental health law for excuse me Janice can I just ask you do you want me to be changing the slides just tell me if if I should be going through the slides okay you can change it now Tina please. okay so how was it that we didn't have a mental health law for the longest time? I don't, since, since I'm new to the advocacy, I only hear bits of the stories, but um, in my observation, health in general is given little importance by the state. Uh, the budget allocation for health is one to less than two percent of the national budget people still here are dying of diarrhea um, and dengue you know, things that you'd think would have been prevented long time ago now um, seven out of ten filipinos die without ever seeing a filipino uh, without ever seeing a, a doctor in their lifetime so Consequently, mental health is uh, is taken for granted as well. Um, it has never been a priority bill until the current administration. The Philippine Psychiatric Association, which has been drafted uh, the producers, um, claim that they have been trying for the last decade to, uh, or the last three congresses in the philippines but to no avail um, because no president has ever made it uh, an agenda in the last decade and then we also have uh, the fact that there is a small number of psychiatrists in the philippines so if you consider 10 years ago, they're probably number two, well, a handful of 300, because right now they, they're only numbering to less than 700, and they themselves have been fighting. So the people to lobby for it is not that uh, forceful um, until this current administration. Yes, Tina, next slide, please. Okay. Oh. How the mental health legislation gained traction. Um, in 2013, the super typhoon Yolanda happened. We had an international name, hey, and we made global news because of these. It ravaged Visayas Islands. It's the third biggest island in the Philippines. It left it over 7,000 people dead, almost wiped out the provinces on the map. It was a massive destruction. After a month, WHO made it one of its top health priorities to scale up mental health and psychosocial support as the Philippines recovers. Uh, WHO estimated over 800,000 people in Yolanda hit areas have suffered different mental health conditions over 2014, so in, within a year, with 80,000 requiring further medication and support. 
So both the WHO and Filipino mental health professionals who volunteered for the psychosocial rehabilitation brought into the limelight the limited mental health law system in place in the country. They were saying, oh, it caught us by surprise. We are ill. It's, we're so ill-prepared. It made a compelling argument to enact uh, a mental health law. So at the time, we are one of the very few countries left in the world which do not have one. And then there's uh, our current president's Duterte's bloody drug war. Um, I believe the international community has been made aware of the extrajudicial killings that have claimed thousands of lives in the name of the anti-drug campaign. The mental health law was not originally in the president's agenda, but according to stories, it was brought to him as a means to soften the blow of his campaign by showing that the law will help rehabilitate those with drug dependency issues and that he's not simply murdering them. Because he drew a lot of flack both from the domestic and international community for his way of dealing with the drug problem in the country. So finally, it became a priority legislation in 17 Congress, the current Congress. And the Department of Health openly asked for its support. Um, celebrities started joining the bandwagon. Um, I remember there was a, an instance of a suicide by the daughter of actors. So. And then the winner of a beauty pageant, international beauty pageant, became a mental health advocate. And so the campaign went strongly to have one. And then there was a terrorist siege and battle of Marawi City. Uh, Marawi is a city in Mindanao, southern part of the Philippines. In May, October um, 2017, it was a five month long armed conflict between government troops and self proclaimed Islamic militants. Um, and, and again, similar to Super Typhoon Yolanda, but of course, though on a lower scale because it only affected one city, residents in evacuation areas were reported to demonstrate mental health problems, which uh, the government used or the adv its advocates used to reinforce the clamor to have the mental health law. And so in June uh, of this year, uh, it was finally enacted. Uh, last year, Senate passed it in May 2017, the House of Representatives in November. And then this year, the, the president signed it into law. Uh, next slide, please, Tina. Our struggles, my struggles. We, we were practically late in the game, so to speak. It was really a huge battle, and we virtually had no machinery to fight. Um, Though there were patient organizations, these were usually led by mental health professionals. They were clinic or hospital based. If you wanted to talk to the, the patients, they would I try talking to them and they would still refer me to talk to our doctor. So that was a, a dead end. Uh, peer support groups were hiding online. And the biggest one just started in 2013. There, there was no psychosocial disability organization, much less uh, a movement. The first time I met fellow activists internationally was November 2014. And then the following year, that was in from TCI Asia plenary. And then the following year, I was already in the thick of the fight against the mental health bills. That was the Congress before this current one. Um, the second factor was 
the cross disability movement did not care uh, save for very very few colleagues like two two three of them um, the mem the the member of the disability movement today it remains fragmented and if it is an issue which does not concern the respective sectors, then the different disability constituents would not engage. Um, that was a disheartening reality, um, which continues today. During the hearings, I could consistently only rely on one, Dr. Lisa Martinez. She is a survivor of cancer and a staunch defender of CRPD, having been involved with the deaf community for um, 20 years. Um, another difficulty was there was no common stand on mental health laws among activists in the international community at the time. I, I, when I refer to international community, I was talking at least in the Asian region because at the time uh, I didn't have exposure to the wider community. I remember that in one of the plenaries of then CZI Asia, the countries were divided between two groups. The group that believes that there should be a no mental health law altogether, and those who believe that a CRPD compliant mental health law is possible. And then I was simply asked to decide on my own. You're the Filipino, you choose on your own, which, which group do you believe in? Um, there was no template on how to fight, especially in the context of our situation um, when the organization is very young, we had lots of limitations and uh, the battle is already this huge. Uh, I literally had to consult seasoned peers individually through correspondence. Um, the fourth one is the human rights movements are oblivious to the human rights disability paradigm. In the, in the Philippines, we have a very advanced social movement, uh, the biggest of which is led by the leftists, which I am a part of. It has overthrown two despotic presidency to the decades and have always been on the front lines of the people's struggles. However, it has ironically not embraced the disability cause yet, though a few of its organizations have taken initiatives in taking up disability advocacy, but its um, constituent uh, particular. We have comrades in the parliament, uh, particularly at the House of Representatives, which is uh, the lower house of Congress, but their most tragic and epic mistake was forgetting to consult with me regarding the mental health legislation and coming up with their own bill that contravenes the CRPD. That was really a, a huge slap because the years before uh, 2016, I have been contacting them, I have sent their position papers so that they don't do the same mistake that one of our uh, party list groups in the House of Representatives did, which was to co-author a mental health bill. So when I asked them, why didn't you uh, talk to me? And the only answer they said was, oh, we forgot you. <laughs> so it was really heartbreaking. Um, then, of course, I have my, my personal limitations. Firstly, I have no background on law. I never had any formal capacity building training on the CRPD, save for brief learning sessions in our TCI Asia gatherings. Unlike my colleagues in the cross-disability movement who were sponsored for full-blown trainings on the CRPD. And as we know, studying laws, the CRPD, and its application to our sector is, is literally an extremely intellectual endeavor. Um, so if, if I'm having 
cognitive meltdowns characteristic of my condition then it became hard for me to read i remember having um, having great difficulties uh, reading through the various UN documents um, my mental health condition also made it hard i have chronic insomnia and anxiety and i attended all hearings and meetings with uh, little to no sleep um, there was a time toward the end of a Senate deliberation hearing when I suffered really mental meltdown and I just could not think anymore. Good thing what was Dr. Lisa was with me, so she helped me through it. And then there's also the part where uh, I had to use my own resources to finance myself in these engagements. And it really has been an expensive endeavor because I live outside the capital uh, like a one to two hours uh, travel from Metro Manila where everything's happening. Uh, I also had to set aside my own daughter's needs to concentrate on the fight. She has a learning disability. So the hardships really took a toll to my entire wellness. And even today, I'm, I'm still paying for, for the price of putting up a big fight. Next slide, Tina. Um, but we, it was, it has been, not why, because it's still not yet uh, finished. It, I, I'd still consider it uh, a worthy, a worthy crusade. Um, there is really a huge advantage of being the pioneer um, organization of persons with psychosocial disabilities, especially because it was anchored on the CRPD. And I firmly believe this was a really crucial and defining factor in establishing our footing in this entire legislative struggle. The country is a state party to the CRPD, and we are an organization that is anchored on it. There was never a phase for psychosocial disability before who talked of human rights until we entered the picture. So as Dr. Lisa once said, we changed the landscape of mental health and psychosocial disabilities discourse in the Philippines by, by showing up. Um, we were able to claim a rightful place in policy making because previously it was always the mental health professionals who would do the talking on our behalf. We participated in all the hearings and stakeholders consultations from beginning to end, including the creation of the implementing rules and regulations, which will come out uh, supposedly this November. Uh, we're hoping the last inputs that we made uh, to narrow down uh, the opportunities for oppression to be put there. Um, we became the voice of the CRPD in the deliberations. Uh, we really stood our ground, even if we were already being perceived as persistent nuisance by the other participants. I've heard from feedback that they were talking ill of us in one of the hearings that I was actually personally attacked and being called the layman person, that we should not listen to layman perspective, and something like that. Um, but it really helped that we have been the first to be recognized as the representative organization, because they cannot just simply show us, they were forced to um, have us involved uh, during the legislative process, even if during the beginning, it was the mental health professionals who took it upon themselves to create the bill. Um, the, la uh, the reason, uh, first CRPD state review, our presence there was also in a big way of vindication for us because as we watched the state, the Philippine state delegation being lectured on 
our new mental health law, validating the assertions that we have been making all throughout the deliberations. It, they also came out in the actual concluding observations by the CRPD committee to the Philippines, um, asking for the review of the mental health law and uh, deleting all the, the repealing uh, legislations or provisions in the legislations that violate the legal capacity in the Fili different Philippine laws. So, um, that's all I have. Tina? Um, okay. Um, thank you. That that was... Um, there was so much in, in... I'm just going to leave to leave up that uh, to leave up your PowerPoint as because it it seems to be better for the video recording to have something on the screen. Um, to me, there were a lot of really interesting points in that, starting from. <coughs> Sorry, I'm trying to just put that. Well, I guess I'll just leave it for now. Starting from the 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 perspective of how neo-colonialism affects the Philippines, including being a source neo-colonialism and the government's policies being a source of mental health problems, and also the the whole trajectory of the country not having mental health legislation. But um, for, for various reasons, that that was simply historical contingencies. The the country eventually came to want to to have mental health legislation, and then um, you were, were 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 somehow left out of of the actual process of making 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 some of that happen. And and also your the perspective of of how the movement has been developing and the CRPD really came up, you know, almost out of almost out of nowhere. In, well, we didn't have that much of a movement in many countries, and people are not necessarily so well prepared to take it on. And you took it on anyway. And so you've developed some experience now. Um, so I, I, I would like to ask a couple of questions and maybe other people have some questions too. I'd like to ask a little bit about the, the, um, the regulations that, the, the, that, that are being implemented. And if you see you know, I guess if you see a possibility to 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 move forward, you know how you see it that so you've changed the landscape in on mental health and psychosocial disability by being present. And yes. is there a way? I mean, what is the impact? Maybe maybe the best way to ask it is what is the impact in policy? And what is if you could say a little bit more about how how that has changed. what is changing uh, in the landscape because of, of this experience and your participation? In terms of the policy? In um, terms of the policy and also in terms of, um, in terms of and anything else, any, how the impact is being felt. So yes, in terms of the policy and any other impact. Um, right. In terms of the policy, we see, we saw the immediate impact, um, especially of the recent state review, because from uh, the, the environment or yeah, the environment before, during the deliberations of the mental health law, where the DO, the Department of Health was completely silent when we talk about, when we invoke the CRPD, when we invoke the disability human rights framework, they were literally silent on it. 
the Commission on Human Rights did not do its work. Even when they were present during the deliberations, they did not defend the CRPD. Um, during the IRR, uh, the implementing rules and regulations crafting, the drafting rather, um, because the chair of the task force of the IRR and the main person of the health department in charge of the mental health law um, were present in Geneva. So we were able to talk there and I told them the mental health law um, criticism would come up. Um, the Commission on Human Rights person was there and they um, the Commission on Human Rights instructed the state delegation to make sure the persons with psychosocial disabilities would be involved in the drafting of this IRR. And then when we went back to Manila, uh, the invitation was there. Uh, and during the actual meeting, those two who have been who were present in Geneva kept referring to us as the representative org, which was not in the case in the, the previous um, hearings. They were not they were not vocal about us, which is really a great uh, leap because it's a recognition of our voice and the voice of the CRPD, and they were admitting during this uh, IRR meeting that. Uh, Indeed, the questions on legal capacity was uh, were a contentious issue, and they will try to incorporate the CRPD uh, concluding observations and, and remarks by the committee. And of, well, of, of course, it's, it's 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 hard now because the the violations are there. Uh, but what? We could have uh, what we could do is to narrow down the opportunities for the oppression and one one of their ways to do that was to tell us instruct us to give them the exact text that we want to see in the IRR mm -hmm. and the Commission on Human Rights uh, made a schedule for us to meet uh, actually work together and again this is the first time from them distancing themselves from the entire process to taking an active lead role in making sure our voice is heard because we were we're not part of the task force they're all government persons and mental health professionals mm -hmm. uh, tragically but uh, our voice was carried by the Commission on Human Rights focal person who is a member of the task force. Um, so hopefully we'll see the, the, the results of that collaboration when the actual um, IRR uh, comes out. Mm -hmm. So that's one. So it's, it's really surreal for <laughs> the government, the, the health officials to be telling a lot of mental health professionals and other stakeholders in that meeting. It was, it was a big meeting. It was made of, I think, more than over 100 people in, in the room. And they kept you know, calling us by first name, telling uh, <laughs> telling the audience that, yes, they, they are the representative organization. <laughs> they were their persons with psychosocial disabilities. Um, because in the law, you could not find the word person with psychosocial disabilities. Uh, or hardly, because it's just all service users, all service users. Then all of a sudden, they're they're mouthing a person with psychosocial disability. You know? mm -hmm. So, so that's a vindication. Sorry. Go ahead. So you think that 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 um, having the CRPD committee actually affirm and stand behind the positions that you were taking actually made a difference with your government that you gov it mattered to your government that the crpd committee yes. actually would 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 be saying yes these people are right you have to listen to them you have <laughs> to pay attention yes yes I, I would like to believe so 
Because mm. to me, when I saw how big the delegation of the Philippines was during the review, and I was told that this was among the biggest delegation ever sent, mm. we would like to believe that the government is taking it seriously to spend that much of, of money to send all these people abroad. Mm -hmm. And it's it's one way of asking them for accountability. So if you're taking this seriously, then you should should consider um, following up on the commitments uh, that you made in this uh, constructive dialogue with the CRPD committee. And 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 we saw that mm -hmm. um, at least initially. So we're we're, we're hoping between um, uh, with the health officials, with the Commission on Human Rights. Uh, which is our national human rights institution. So hopefully that happens. Um, yeah, I have up on the screen, I found the, the CRPD committee's concluding observations to the Philippines. And so I put up on the screen what they say about the Mental Health Act. I don't know if you wanna say anything more about that or just you know, I, I just thought it would be interesting for people to see. Um, and, 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 you know, I'd like to invite anybody who has any questions to, to ask Janice. Everybody, um, I think in most countries where people are either fighting an exist, I think probably in most countries, people are trying to repeal an existing mental health law and capacity laws, and it's a pretty it's a pretty big struggle everywhere. It's it's pretty mm -hmm. hard. So, any any um, comments, questions, discussion from our participants? And you can write in the chat box if you'd rather not use the microphone. Just letting you know, I would like to make the recording of this public because it's it's a valuable resource. So please, if you take the microphone to ask a question or make a comment, be aware that this is going to be made public. And if you'd rather not make a comment publicly, then you can write something in the chat box and I can read it aloud for Janice to answer. I, I just would like to add, because uh, we were talking about the impact, um, also among our peers, uh, because we have been very active uh, with this whole process, we have, well, I have been viewed as an authority on this matter. They just no longer take what the doctors are telling them. They would actually ask me what's the take. So instead of the mental health professionals having the monopoly of, of wisdom, so to speak, or influence on, on peers. Um, now they have a counterpart person that they could uh, go to. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like and, you, sorry, go ahead. And even some of the media um, outfits were knocking on our doors to ask for um, our sentiment and it's also been published. So, um, I think, um, I believe that's, that's good instead of, I did, we did not make it a walk in the park for the lobbies of the mental health law. So I think that's one of the big impacts as well of our active presence in this whole process. Yeah, that's great. And and I think that that yeah, there's a there's a wide variety of of how mo the movements exist and how they're treated by the media. I know in 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 the US we're really not approached by the media. The media usually will will talk to the voices of the family organizations despite the fact that we have a pretty big movement here. And so that's a real that's a real accomplishment, especially in in such a short time, and that you're yes. yeah that you're becoming seen also by peers as a as a as 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 a real source of knowledge 
to counter what you know the, the psychiatrist and the mental health system are saying. So that's that's all building the movement as a whole and building it on a human rights basis. Do we have any questions for Janice from other participants? Hi, Janice. Hello, Amy. Hi, I'm wondering, okay, actually I've asked you before, but um, could you tell us a bit about how you built a movement in such a short time? How, how I built a movement? Uh, yeah. Uh, we're, we're still not a big, we're still not a big movement, although our influence is, is getting bigger because it, it's still, if, if you want to talk about the resource when it comes to CRPD, it's, it's still just me today because like I said earlier, it's, it's really a highly intellectual endeavor and not everyone wants to read, not everyone wants to, to study. Um, what I did was, because at the time, it was really hard to concentrate on uh, the papers. When I said papers, the legislative process, and then trying to build an organization. Um, so what I did before was to contact the, because there were several to contact the founders or administrators of the uh, peer support groups online and made myself a member of these online groups. Um, I also uh, made an alliance with uh, persons with psoriasis, because they are a more established group in the Philippines. And persons with psoriasis are largely persons with psychosocial disabilities and orthopedic disabilities as well. Um, so that I would have uh, more allies. Um, and then of course, uh, try to convince the, the leaders of the cross-disability movement. Um, but largely because I guess my, my organizational leadership skills is, is, is weak at this, at this point in time or in the last years. So what I did was to go to those who have already established organizations and try to influence their leaders so that in turn, these leaders would uh, try to influence their members. And with Rises Philippines, that has happened. And, and same is true with the, uh, the, the, the other biggest online peer support group. I think you're very successful for such a short time I mean, better than me, so <laughs> I'm not really an organizer either, so it really helps to know your experience. Oh, um, I want to ask, um, Psoriasis Philippines also has a non-coercive approach, right, to people when people are in... Yes, 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 they're... Yes, they're actually, um, this was a, um, what was that? Uh, there's, a, there's a pros and cons to uh, the, the psoriasis, uh, persons with psoriasis, uh, not having a medical model or view perspective on helping out with their mental health issues. Um, it's really rare that uh, they would go to a psychiatrist. That's why when we... Tina, are you uh, familiar with the What We Need campaign? Uh, yes. Yes, I am. Why don't you explain it, though, for everyone? Uh, the What We Need campaign has been launched in response to the Global Mental Ministerial Mental Health Summit that took place in London. In, during the first week of October, during the Mental Health Week, but it was an event that was uh, devoid of the presence of, of the genuine voices of the psychosocial disability movement. It was WHO and 
mental health professionals, and they were really propagating the idea of making psychiatry as the default um, go-to when it comes to mental health. And we wanted to counter that. So they launched the, the various activist group, launched a global uh, what we need campaign um, with the and I did it with the persons with so, so with Rice's Philippines, and we had a photo campaign. Um, what we need had a photo campaign. Uh, our contribution to that uh, was with the persons with Rice's, and in their banners, you could see uh, pictures of persons with Rice's holding up. What we need for our mental health is not psychiatric meds, but a treatment for our uh, psoriasis. What we, what we need is not uh, psychiatric care, but uh, an end to stigmatization against persons with psoriasis and, and, and lines like that. So outrightly, they are um, denouncing, uh, denouncing, but telling the world that you know, mental health is not always psychiatrically addressed and need not be, as in the case of persons with psoriasis, because their mental health problems could uh, be significantly helped through other means. So anyways, um, but they don't have the issues with legal capacity the way we do. Mm -hmm. So that's the one downside to it. So when, when they, when we, I, when I was talking to them about mental health law, they didn't really share the enthusiasm because uh, for them it has no impact in their lives because they don't have our struggles in, in in terms of involuntary treatment, which is the crux of our battle. So, right. but they were instrumental, at least in telling the society that contrary to what mental health professionals are always saying to go get professional help from mental health professionals, they are uh, a testimonial that that is not the case. Mm -hmm. What about in the, like in the case of, you know, the, the kind of experiences like anxiety and depression and hearing voices or you know unusual beliefs and that kind of thing that the the for which we may get labeled as schizophrenic or bipolar and is is there any discussion and i know that you're you, it seems like you're the first person really to be bringing a new way of thinking on mental health yeah. issues and is there any have have you been able to you know create any space for people to think about those kind of issues also as well maybe we don't need a psychiatrist maybe what the psychiatrists are offering us even in those situations is really not the right thing and there's other ways to think about it uh Yes, and during the deliberations, uh, it is at least in the um, uh, in the deliberations, I put that forward uh, uh, very uh, assertively. Um, in terms of, because uh, like I said earlier, I'm a member of the uh, peer support group community online, and uh, I taken that platform to influence. Uh, peers in these discussions and 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 some and some of them, especially the leaders, are are taking up the advocacy and echoing the sentiments because some of them are um, withdrawing from drugs, from so their uh, the influence is is uh, getting bigger. I mean, it, it's still more small, small compared to the highly medicalized perspective of a lot of peers, but it's it's gaining traction. Mm -hmm. 
and the you... presence yes sorry i i that's it's a bad habit for me to interrupt finish please finish <laughs> and i'll ask after so yes the, I've, I've taken that those platforms so how do you see the relationship between countering the medical model and and also um, the struggle to abolish coercion, the struggle to abolish compulsory hospitalization and compulsory treatment. Do you see it as related? I mean, th this is a question that, that I ask myself that I think has been a part of a question for the movement in the US and, and also internationally from what I see. Um, how would you see the relationship between raising awareness that uh, against the medical model, raising awareness that there's other ways to think about these experiences that psychiatry labels as mental illness and the things they want to do to treat it, um, as opposed to, sorry, I, I, I'm getting a little bit, you know, <laughs> The, the relationship between countering the medical model and fighting against the coerce, the legal permission for coercion that's in the mental health laws. Because I think there's, there's a lot of very interesting ways that we ca can counter the medical model also through social criticism, like what you said in the beginning about neo-colonialism and government policy as as the real source of mental health problems that's you know that that's one way of thinking about it and you know you can ap approach this kind of social criticism from from a perspective in terms of patriarchy and all kinds of and 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 other ways of looking at intolerance also and i i mean just to there's many ways that we can look at alternative explanations for what's going on in a person's life that don't that can that can just throw away the psychiatric diagnoses as a way of labeling and and trying to explain the person so there's that and then there's the fact that the law allows them to take you against your will imprison you in a psychiatric hospital, you know, imprison because it's in fact a prison taking away your liberty and, and, and force you to have drugs or electroshock. So I guess one of the questions for me that I think can be useful to make the link in advocacy between what is, what is actually the link between those two things and I don't always do it necessarily very well myself. It's it's a question. So I was just wondering what, what you would think about that. Um, personally, my prime mover why I took this advocacy and this feat was um, my tragic experience with, with, with psychiatric medications and initial uh, experiences with psychiatry. And I really wanted to raise um, awareness of the evil behind the medical model mm -hmm. um, which could ruin lives because because it literally ruined mine um, for 12 years mm -hmm. it's really a uh, very very personal to me um, not just that just political um, and to me, there is there is a, a connect, and it's it, it's primary part of uh, my battle plan to reach people with this knowledge of why the medical model is is, is really awful. And even in the disability sensitivity trainings that I have been doing, I have been raising um, this issue on the biomedical model to introduce the new concept of the human rights disability model that mm -hmm. this illness disease model is is very problematic at best and that it lacks sufficient you know, 
uh, scientific or medical evidence. Or when I when I start telling them how we are being diagnosed, the people could not the audience would could not believe it. And the other thing is for the for so those are for the non persons with disabilities. So for persons with psychosocial disabilities, it's it the your the presence really your presence, my presence is really, really huge. When they learn that I I don't I have withdrawn from meds for three years, mm-hmm. I do alternative um, therapies, though I still consult with a psychiatrist that I trust from the activist movement who no longer forced me to take medications. Um, it opens up a whole new world to them. Because sometimes it's one of the things that... Um, it's what it takes for them to see a real person who could uh, validate what they have in mind. Is it really possible to not have medications? Is it really possible to lead a long, normal life, a uh, uh, drug-free life, psychiatric-free life? And, and, and a lot of people have come to me and, and thank me because um, their kids have been prevented from falling into the trap of psychiatry and they're thanking oh. for coming out because mm. uh, I gave them a, a, a new picture like what you said mm-hmm. yes it, it's really part of my advocacy to mm-hmm. expose the medical uh, model even to doctors I would not be uh, daunted to tell it to their faces and and I've and I've already done that. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and is there like, do you? Do you Although it's, have, it's hard, it's, it's really hard, especially among peers who have been so uh, brainwashed, so to speak, already, or highly been influenced by the medical model. Mm-hmm. Because um, at this point in time, for a lot of peers, they have just started to make sense of what's going on in their life. Mm-hmm. because it was medically explained to them. And then for me to tell them, oh, no, that's wrong, <laughs> it's, it's making them confused. Like, mm-hmm. I've just, for them, it's, I've just had this identity, now they're taking it away from me. <laughs> so it's, it's a continuous um, uh, explaining. Yeah. Yeah. I have one other question. What do you think that it would be useful to have? You mentioned that um, in the psychosocial disability sector, most most of most of our activists haven't gotten any comprehensive training in the CRPD. What what kind of training? I mean, do you see a role for something like an I don't want to say easy read because that seems to have a, a specific connotation and for people with intellectual or cognitive disabilities, which, which I mean, could also be useful for, for anybody, including people with psychosocial disabilities, but for some kind of pretty basic and easy and good explanation of the CRPD and is that something? I mean, do you is 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 do you see a, a a way that people could work on that together? Because that's been proposed, and you know, different kinds of training. This course that that I've been giving is is trying to be a training, but doesn't reach that many people. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any ideas about what kinds of, if if training or different kinds of resource materials would be useful to 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 be creating together and how the and 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 what kinds, so to to inform more people about the CRPD. Yeah, it really it really is a challenge, um, especially the language. It, it was mm-hmm. so it was so hard to translate the, um, even the the description of disability in the CRPD. It, it took me a long time mm-hmm. to properly translate it in simple and or plain Filipino. It, it it it's it's a struggle. 
Yeah, I have to rely on uh, making it look like a mathematic formula. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like uh, like making a diagram to show this plus this equals yeah, that yeah, kind of thing. Sequence participation equals disability. Right, so, right. Something mm -hmm. like if, if you use the, uh, it, it, that? It, it really turns off a lot of peers when I tell her, um, read this. It, uh, I just, just from the, the physical look of the CRPD, it's really daunting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then when you apply it to the psychosocial disability, it becomes more. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So I see a couple of comments from Nat in the chat. Um, if it's okay, I'll read that out. Um, she says, I think, I think we need the alternatives available, but most of the time these are too costly and can only be reached privately perhaps. And she also says holistic and integrative medicine is a way forward, but there's no space for big pharma there. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if you want to comment on that, Janice. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's the same situation in the Philippines. Because um, it's not true that there are no alternatives here. But like Nat said, it's not, they're not accessible. Um, they're costly. I mean, psychologists are costly. Um, even even a, a plain, simple massage. <laughs> if you go to a massage parlor, with, with blind masseuse, it would still take someone's or eighty percent of their minimum wage in the Philippines to avail of that. No. Do you have a concept? Um, I mean, in in the Philippines and in the way the mental health law has developed, I, I remember I've read it. I don't remember what it what it actually looks like, but. I mean, when we're talking about, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to frame a question. So when we're talking about deprivation of liberty, compulsory hospitalization, mm -hmm. there's, there's usually a few different things we're talking about. Because one, we're talking about long-term institutionalization. That aspect is usually the easiest for people to agree that shouldn't be done. Then we're talking about short-term hospitalization and even the concept of what psychiatrists want to characterize as an emergency. And that I think is actually the most, the most crucial and the most difficult to combat because that's where we want to take away the whole of psychiatrists' power to control anything about people and i'm wondering if there's like a, a you know how that gets talked about in the philippines is there you know is there in in some countries like in the u.s and japan and yeah i guess it's, well those two i know about there's 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 a way of saying talking about people with psychosocial disabilities as if it's all equated to violence and, oh, you just have to be afraid that this person is, is going to, to, you know, to come and, and, and make some mass attack against people. Um, so that justifies the government's retaining this kind of coercive power. Is, is, is that kind of narrative happening in the Philippines or how do psychiatrists justify keeping, keeping that kind of power? Uh, they always use the mantra, you're a danger to yourself and to others. Mm. Yeah. That was even stated in the law. Um, what we tried to do with the IRR together with the Commission on Human Rights um, um, was to um, shorten, because in the law it says 15 days they could keep you in the facility. And in the RRR, we said that uh, if the person has regained capacity, whatever that 
Where in, in within 24 hours, I think what we wrote is 24 hours, she should be released. Or whatever, I um, mean, the advanced, another uh, portion that we uh, focus on was the advanced directive part. Mm -hmm. uh, that the government should launch a really massive campaign on advanced directives. Um, Hmm. So if a person, if then a person would have an advanced directive, would it be able to prevent the forced hospitalization or would it just be able to prevent, say, using, using drugs or using a drug, one particular drug the person didn't like? How, 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 how yes. strong advanced um, directives would you, do, do you have possible? Yes, it could prevent um, um, hospitalization or administration of, of, of drugs. Um, the problem is when um, someone declares you, uh, it is an, an emergency and you're being, uh, you're posing as a danger to yourself and to others, then it, it, it's overridden. Wow. And so if, if they declare your, is it how, how much, how, sorry, I, I'm trying to, to, to type at the same time and then I mute myself, but then I'm, I'm still talking. Um, how, how, I mean, maybe the mental, the mental health law hasn't even really been used much yet. And, no. Because it's just been put into practice because I would wonder, you know, how if that is just going to become, well, that's the big loophole and everybody gets characterized as being a danger to themselves or others. That's pretty much the way we have it here, that, that, yes. that it's pretty meaningless to actually say that. Um, so um, what we put... Yeah. What we put in the IRR, and hopefully it, it becomes accepted, is that it's just not the psychiatrist which has to say if you have lost, uh, if you have a temporary loss of uh, decision making capacity and it's if it's really an emergency. We included that family should also be there, that representative organization of person with disabilities or psychosocial disabilities be also be present in the determination of that. And this should be done after 24 hours of the emergency within and then after again, so that the possibility of, of, of further incarceration would be prevented. Hmm. And do you see any, like, I mean, how do you see the, the relationship between that and, and doing away with these coercive systems entirely? And I guess I wanted to ask, you know, how did, how did this all work before the mental health law? Was, were people simply being put into psychiatric hospitals and, and, and then they just couldn't get out? Or how did it actually work? Because what is, what is, did the mental health law bring in coercion? Did it bring in more of a power of coercion? Or did the power exist, but it just wasn't, wasn't legislated before? And then how do you think about the, the possibility of actually getting rid of the coercion now, especially now that it's, that it's, being, that it's been given the legislative you know, authority and um, however the implementing regulations work, they're still going to be, um, they're still going to be legitimizing that coercive authority, even if it's mitigating that. So those are kind of yes. two questions. Yes. Um, yes. The practice has been there. Um, although we have, we didn't, although if we didn't have mental health registration, the practice of coercive treatments, has have been in place. We have uh, 
one law from the Supreme Court that where they could actually uh, get someone inside a mental health facility. One could petition for someone to be placed there. And our forensic uh, patients, those who have been uh, involved with the courts using insanity as a plea or something like that, um, they go straight to the National Center for Mental Health or a mental health hospital. Um, so yes, it just gave more uh, legitimization of, of what has the practice been. Uh, but on the other hand, because it claimed to be it claims to be a human rights based um, in, instead of uh, the automatic uh, decision being made by parents, by families, or uh, spouses, the mental health law allow for uh, the person to appoint her own his or her own. Uh, representative, legal representative. Um, and then there's the advanced directive provision. And now, because uh, the prevailing practice is doctors just administer the treatments on you. Uh, they prescribe medicines, right? Uh, in the law, uh, if the doctors do not uh, ask for informed consent, then he'd be liable uh, criminally. Um, and yes, one of the things that we're still looking uh, uh, doing is to actually have the provision of the law repealed. Because um, we know that it was, uh, it would be a very hard fight during the mental health legislation to actually stop it. But what we're looking at is uh, look at how the mental health law will impact uh, the persons with psychosocial disabilities and then present a compelling argument to have that repeal. And hopefully this time, uh, our comrades from uh, the House of Rep Representatives would be wise now to um, <laughs> take our, our our recommendation yeah do you think do you think that there was a kind of discrimination in that do you think that that they're just uncomfortable with seeing people with psychosocial disabilities as as actually you know, speaking for ourselves and a valid constituency that that should be the ones making policy, or or was it really just an oversight that that you know that wasn't really about discrimination? Uh, which part, the, my comrades or your the comrades? Other your comrades. Yeah, oversight. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, that's that's better. That's good. <laughs> So next time, next Congress, I could tell them, will you go now and have this repealed? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's good. One thing that I know that um, has been talked about in, in other countries, actually what they've, what, what they, well, one of the things they, that, that they did in Peru in relation to the, ref, the legal capacity reform and that they might do also in relation to, to the next parts of the reform is to make a study of how the laws are actually being used. And also in both France and Korea, I know that studies were done after a new mental health law was passed. In both countries, there had been an existing mental health law and, the, and, and a new one was passed actually in both countries after the CRPD was enacted and the law was passed claiming to limit some forms of coercion, but in fact, in both countries, they also opened up the door to, to more coercion. And, and then you can show using statistics that that was actually the effect and, and that it did open up more coercion. I don't know if that's, if in those countries, it's really going to 
to be persuasive to say, well, look, you, 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 you said you were doing a human rights based law, but you've actually made more coercion to the extent that people will, you know, to what extent are people going to think, well, that's a bad thing or to what extent are people going to say, well, yeah, I guess that's what we wanted to do. And I guess people need to be coerced, need in quotes. Um, but I, but the idea of making studies about it, if if there's an if there's a legislature that's open-minded or potentially open-minded, could be useful. Yeah, that, that it would be really good to have this study like that here yeah. as well. Because mm -hmm. we don't even have a baseline. Mm -hmm. We don't know how many people are incarcerated. Uh, we don't know the situation or even the Department of Health doesn't know it. When you ask them for mm. data, they would openly say they don't have it. So wow. Yeah. It's your baseline, how the, the mental health law will help you or, mm -hmm. or the impact of mental health law in, in the country. Mm-hmm. Initial and, has, and oh, sorry, go ahead. Finish, please. And I'm hoping the, the concluding observations will also have an impact i i guess just the, i i want to i want to read anisha's question but i also just have one follow-up uh, on this um in looking at the concluding observations they mention that they mention the committee's guidelines on the right to liberty and security of persons with psychosocial disabilities has has there been discussion of those guidelines? Because the guidelines, I think, are pretty clear that it requires the abolition of all of these different, you know, long-term, short-term, danger to self or others, whatever, kind of forced hospitalizations. Has there been any discussion of of that, the, the committee's guidelines on Article 14? No. No, because because yeah. even the CRPD itself, the main text is is not is not being talked about. They just mouth it, but they don't know right. what's in it. Right. So yeah, I mean that seems to be a problem. But maybe that's if you're able in the next Congress to 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 get your comrades to pay attention, that could be something that gets brought up, and you know. Um, let them let them take a look at that. Let them study those guidelines and and call in some experts to, you know, to to talk about and explain it. If there's anything that that needs explanation, um, since it is mentioned in the concluding observations, it could be because that's another document of the committee. Um, that that goes into more depth than the than the concluding observations. I don't know. Maybe the concluding observations are themselves pretty clear. Yes, we even have to start as basic as what is the human rights paradigm to disability. Because mm. even that, like I said, is is uh, the human rights movement is oblivious to that. Yeah. So. One of the steps I'm um, taking is is to make the comrades aware because we really are the biggest mm. movement in the country. Mm. And we have the most potential to make the change. And so it's, it's really up to me to um, to make them wiser with, with, with this entire disability. And it's just not psychosocial disability, but disability in, yeah. in its entirety. It's, yeah. it's really a whole new thing to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a powerful possibility to, to be part of a leftist movement and a, and a, and a total human rights movement. Because they're already taking the, uh, they're already familiar with the social economic determinants of mental health that I've been talking about. They know that this is not just, mm -hmm. it's really the government's fault. <laughs> so it's, right. it's not a hard sound to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess then the the perspective that, that we're all in this together and that, that everybody's suffering and that we're all human beings, you don't 
label somebody that it really is serving the cause of capitalism or neo-colonialism yeah. to, to, to set people out and blame them. Is that the way, like, is that the way you would think about it? Also, or I don't know, maybe I'm just um, kind of going off on a different tangent there. Um, I don't know. I didn't. Looks like you may be trying to talk, but I'm not hearing. It is not because I've I've started out with one discussion, like a disability orientation among uh, a group of community organizers from the leftist group, and they were very receptive to it because I don't have to tell them <laughs> what caused me to be this is uh, the government. They know that. Mm -hmm. And they know that pharma industries are mm -hmm. capitalist mm -hmm. <laughs> entities. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It's not a hard sell. It's just a matter yeah. of reaching out to them mm -hmm. fast. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. I mean, I think that's, that's really <laughs> enviable in some ways that, that, that that's that you have such a strong movement that um and 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 you and your own linkage to it to be able yeah. to to make those connections in action and as political organization because I don't think we have that in in some other country. Yeah. <laughs> no, in the US, I, I don't think so. No, we don't. I mean, we struggle. It, I mean, we have a very small leftist movement in the U.S., but even there, we really struggle. Um, where where many people on the left just don't just don't see it, or they might kind of see it theoretically as a linkage to capitalism, and also racism and and everything else, but that they wouldn't they would still think well, but but still these people are too um, dangerous, and we need to protect them. They would still take the whole nasty mantra of psychiatry. I, I want to get, uh, read out the questions and comments from Anisha. Um, she says, people suffering from pollution being subjected to forced psychiatry. Um, I think that wow. referring early on, I think you may have referred to environmental policy. Um, so she wants to bring that out and ask, also, does anyone get mentally ill for speaking out against environmental issues? So you can respond to that, and then she has another comment. Yeah. I have I've not heard of uh, people suffering from pollution being subjected to forced psychiatry. It is in, that's the first time I've heard of it. I know LGBT being subjected to psychiatric um, treatment that people suffering from pollution that's the first for me mm -hmm. maybe maybe she initial will will want to explain um Inisha, if you wanted to to take the microphone and speak for um just keeping in mind it's if or, or if that it's a public recording for everyone or if you want to comment in the um, in the chat? That's fine. I'm going to read your your second comment. She says Nauru does doesn't have a mental health act, and the government has sent psychiatrists and psychologists psychologists out of the country that have been forcibly or coercively treating refugees. That the government of Nauru has sent has 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 just made sent psychiatrists and psychologists out of the country that were forcibly or coercively treating refugees. The Australian media reports this as horrendous. This act of the Nauru government, and she says, "I see it as the government doing something to fight exploitative powers slash capitalism." What do you think of that, Janice? Do you have a comment? Mm. 
Sen Tedesco and the Tabuddin. So they're they're sending psychiatrists and psychologists to treat refugees. I'm not. I'm I think, not, from my not, understanding <laughs> of what she has said, of 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 how this has played out, and and Anisha might want to explain more that there were psychiatrists and psychologists who were in Nauru treating refugees coercively or forcibly and they sent them out and the Australian media reports it as horrendous that they sent away the psychiatrists and psychologists um, you know but as this is this is just what what is being reported by the media and you know the question is is it good or bad that they're that they're sending away these psychiatrists and psychologists so i don't know if you know anything about that situation um maybe yeah what what i'm interested in um is that i mean there are australia's doing a big push because Nauru was more or less going to be um, part of Australia and they had to fight to be free, uh, I think, in the 60s. So I'm, I'm seeing as Australia trying to have control there um, or, or big companies rather trying to have control there. And I'm um, seeing that as a push potentially to get them a Mental Health Act um, via a, um, a psychiatrist lobby um, through using the refugee crisis um, and then being uh, detained and, and um, put through um, a horrible long, long detention as well as them being um, subjected to forced psychiatry by the psychiatrists that go there. And then uh, the reporting of them being lying in bed and we we know that forced um, neuroleptics and so forth cause us uh, to uh, um, often not be able to stay awake more than 23 hours a day on high doses so and those uh, drugs are horrendously horrible to us um, so I you know when I see this kind of reporting and, um, and and the reporting of, of your country as well. I I'm wondering, you know, what, what's where where is the truth? You know, what you know, I can put my slant on it, but that's coming from a place where we've just had mental health legislation for a really really long time, and before that they had people being locked away in uh, you know other forms of uh, locking people away and um, doing th things to them before the medicos came. So, just wondering your your opinion on that period of of, of um, a country being coerced, more or less, to um, take on psychiatrists, and whether a government fighting that is um, doing something and should be heard from their perspective. Janice, do you have a comment on that, or is it something that that you don't feel that that you could comment on? Yeah, it's not something that I could comment on because I don't know the situation in Nauru. Mm -hmm. Well, I have another. Um, if, I'd like to ask if there's more questions, but maybe um, you could also tell us a little bit more about TCI Asia and. Um, 
how TCI Asia got organized and and um, what 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 kinds of activities it's been doing. Um, I think the the Mad in Asia blog is also a really exciting development. So, is there anything that that you would want to um, to tell? to tell us about those developments in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, um, TCI Asia Pacific, start as TCI Asia, it just became TCI Asia Pacific uh, last August. Um, it's a regional uh, organization of persons with psychosocial disabilities uh, that are anchored on enhancing the pedagogy and practice of particular DD Article 19 of the CRPD. So uh, uh, it, it brings together uh, different organizations and individuals from different countries. I think we're at 22 countries now. Mm. Um, started in uh, 20, 20, not 2014, 2013 or 2012. That wasn't part of the, the first um, plenary where there were just four countries. Uh, we do we do capacity uh, building. Uh, we are also active in the uh, international engagement, like the UN. Uh, uh, some of us reviewed the WHO quality rights training modules. Uh, well, what else? Uh, we have uh, partnered with, uh, with uh, INTAR mm -hmm. uh, in India in 2016. So we are, uh, we are a, a growing organic because uh, like you said, there has not been a voice from the South for the longest time. Mm -hmm. And this is our contribution to make that voice amplified and more powerful uh, because we really are coming from a different uh, context. So I remember in Ireland when the Global North speakers were talking of their struggles and uh, a lot of the, the participants from the Global South are like, what? Like, huh? <laughs> Could like, not relate what, to Can it. you give an example of what kinds of things that when the Global North participants, how you, what, how you see the, the difference? What were the kinds of things that were not really... Uh, one was that when they talked about, when they were complaining, this was, I think, Australians, uh, they were complaining about the residential setups, like residences for persons with disabilities. Oh. And, and I, I remember one of the reaction was, what, you have a roof on your head, you have free food and you're still complaining? Hmm. And so, that effect because in the developing countries, the primary, one of the primary issues is still housing. Mm -hmm. or food or potable water and then you hear global north uh, speakers and activists uh, talking of compulsory treatment orders or residence problems or residential problems it's there, there was there is so you don't disconnect. have like so you wouldn't you don't have the kind of things that are like institutions in the community that's like a kind of facility where people um, don't really have freedom, but it's not an institution. I mean, cause I think that, I don't know what they were talking about in Ireland, but um, that's something that the UN has condemned the use of any kind of institution as a way of saying that you're satisfying people's basic needs. Yes. Uh, in, in Asia, we, uh, we do we do have institutions, but not as many as in the West. Uh -huh. um, in the Philippines, we have three. We just have three, but we do have what do you call social care institutions? Mm -hmm. we, they're not primarily psychiatric in nature, but people are still being put there. 
Um, we still need a lot of research to to find out what's going on there because in Indonesia, uh, Yanni was claiming they are horrible. Mm -hmm. um, India still have a lot of institutions, like 400 of them. Yeah. Because I, sorry, it's, Janice, it's, go ahead. Um, Janice, I was wondering, when you were talking about the institutions, are you talking about in India, the 400, are they psychiatric institutions or are they the beggar's homes? They are asylums. Yes, mental health okay. asylums. asylums. Um, in Indonesia, it, it's a combination of uh, psychiatric institutions and social care institutions. Okay. Are, are people... Places for Sorry, are people forced to stay in these institute in these welfare homes? Like, will they get arrested if they leave? Yes. 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 Okay. Same in Singapore. Yes. They're forced against their will. Like, they wouldn't have if they wanted to leave, they would be stopped from leaving. Yes. Hmm. We have them too here, but very few I mean, in comparison to other countries especially the western and the first world ones hmm. because yeah, we have both kinds of institutions we have institutions where people would be prevented from leaving if they try to leave and we also mm -hmm. have institutions in the u.s and i know even it, bigger in, in some Latin American countries where people are, people just go because of mostly poverty and because once you've been in the mental health system and you're poor, you can't afford housing, but mm. you can go into these places and they'll give you a roof over your head and they'll give you food, but you also are going to have to take drugs and you're going to be under the watchful eye of psychiatric nurses who can then have you locked up again at any time and those are two different kinds of institutions and and do you, do you have anything like that the kinds of institutions where people go really for for economic reasons mm. I, I don't I don't think so. What we have, what I'm uh, knowledgeable about is, is we do have a place for the abandoned. Mm -hmm. But uh, like I said, because of uh, budget constraints, they they don't do um, psychiatric medication. Huh. Okay. No. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. We have very few. We have very few uh, state mental hospitals and then there's right i think there there's just less than 50 in the entire country because hmm. uh, some of the facilities at least the state runs they are incorporated in the hospitals general hospitals so they would only have a ward and they could not keep patients there for a long time hmm. it would just be co uh, cost prohibitive for the state hmm. So there's a lot less that's being done for for reasons of 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 not having the resources, and some of the things yeah. that aren't being done are things that should be done. But some of the things that aren't being done for lack of resources are things that that we wouldn't really want to have done anyway. Right. Yeah. Emmy, did you want? Were you? saying something before and and i and Nisha also has some oh no i forgot what i was going to say but i don't think it's important <laughs> okay anisha is asking some questions do their families have to pay for the institutions is one question. yes in private in the private ones yes mm -hmm. and then that's when that's where I've heard of reports that uh, families are being detained there because their their loved ones don't want to have anything to do with them, so they just keep paying 
these institutions? Wait. These private institutions? So the families keep, and, 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 and what did you say about families being detained? Um, the persons with psychosocial disabilities would um, have their family members locked up there, and they would just keep on paying these private mental health facilities to keep their family member there. Mm. They don't want to care for them anymore. Right, right, right. Okay. And um, question, another question from Anisha. Oh, oh. Go ahead, Emmy. Oh, follow-up question. Um, so does this have, is this related to the Mental Health Act? Is this justified under the Mental Health Act? Or is it like sort of like, oh, okay, your family wants you there, so then the institution just keeps you? It would go against the Mental Health Act. Because they, are, they stated the duration of the possible stay, which is uh, 15 days, should also have been locked up um, for years, should be uh, freed now. And that's what the doctor actually has said. It's going to make their lives easy because now they have the license to release their patients because before they were, they were scared of liabilities. Mm -hmm. If they release their patients earlier than what the families want, then they'd be made liable. But with the mental health law now, where it says you cannot uh, detain people against their wills unless it's an emergency, then the, if the patients would say, I want to go home now, they would be, well, supposed to be, they would be free to go. Um, does the Mental Health Act say anything about, besides being um, dangerous to self or others, do they have any cause that says that if, if um, treatment is necessary to prevent a deterioration, so-called deterioration in your con con um, condition. And also, is there a possibility in the act to renew the detention after 15 days? Say that again, Emmy. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so um, firstly, the first part was, um, oh, God. anyway, the second part was, um, is there an option to detain a person, renew the detention order beyond 15 days? And then the other question was, is there a clause in the Mental Health Act about um, if it's not an emergency, but um, if it's what they call necessary to prevent deterioration in the condition, is that a ground for detention as well? The other one, uh, uh, if it's causing deterioration, no. It has to be emergency only, and if the person has lost temporal uh Capac loss, temporal loss of decision-making capacity. Those are it. And yes, the 15 days can be prolonged. Um, it's just that the law says the internal review board should uh, review the case of the involuntary treatment within 15 days. Okay, thank you. Um, in human research, um, I'm not familiar with the uh, human research on. regarding the human research on drugs being pushed. Like I said, if you ask um, data from the government, they don't have it. Even the statistics for persons with so-called mental disorders, they don't have it. So if you ask for research, then most probably they would say, we don't have it. Cost prohibitive mainly to uh, cause it's not just simply uh, prohibitive mainly to do with construction resources, but the lands themselves were to construct these institutions. I, I personally am not seeing this mental health law as producing more institutions the way it happened in Japan and in Korea, mm -hmm. where their mental health laws produced more. Mm -hmm. Because in the law, in, in our mental health law, there is a provision to promote the, in the, uh, the institutionalization in the communities. And uh, they, the law tasks the local government to see to it that the institutionalization happens. 
does it say how the deinstitutionalization should happen? I mean, no, is there going to no, be a way? No. Like, how are people are people going to end up going back to their families, or will they face job discrimination? Is there any kind of like? Is there any kind of economic assistance for them? Because what has I mean? Then then the concern would also be that the psychiatric industry would would develop some kind of profit making small institutions in the community and say that this is deinstitutionalization. We're going to house people with psychosocial disabilities. It, I mean, do you foresee anything like that happening or what's going to happen with people? Coming hey, uh, honestly, I'm not seeing that yeah. because it goes back to what I'm saying earlier that even general health is being neglected. We have very few hospitals, we have very few health centers. So I don't see uh, mental health facilities being erected. So what well, uh, what I could what I could foresee is having um, general hospitals um, creating wards. Mm -hmm. But these are still short-term um, inpatient hospitalization because I'm sure it, it's, it's cost prohibitive for them to detain. In, in terms of the um, li people's living situation, are, is, are they would they go back to their families? I mean, the people who are going to be let out of the institutions. Is that is yeah. that yeah. They're supposed to be. The problem is their own families, and and this is from the director of the National Mental Hospital. He said the problems that we're always facing is that the families don't want them back. Right. The communities don't want them back. What do we do with them? Right. And is how is that going to be addressed? Is it is it that being talked about? No, no, not at all. Yeah, because that I think is. I mean. If that's one of the, the concrete outcomes of the Mental Health Act that actually seems that it should be positive, I think the question of how, how to combat the discrimination in the communities and how to ensure people will actually have a place, I think that could be really crucial and that that, that part should not be supervised by the mental health system. That, that, that's, I think, could be a big challenge or else it's just may mean that it won't happen. I don't know that that would just be my, my concern if this was... Sorry, I don't think... Um, yeah. The good thing in the Philippines is we don't have that big of a mental health workforce. Yeah. They simply could not afford to uh, yeah. take care of, to have them supervised by psychiatrists or okay. psychiatric nurses. They can't. So then what they would do is just, so, so then it's just an issue that has to be somehow addressed in a positive way for deinstitutionalization to actually happen if the families and communities are going to be rejecting people. Mm. Right? I mean, would you see like that would you see that as a problem or you you would just see that well it's going to happen and people will have to and something will have to change? Yes, something will have to change because mm. the housing problem just a problem for a person with disabilities. Mm -hmm. The housing problem is a huge problem by the poor in the country. Mm -hmm. That's still not being addressed. So right. I don't know what's going to happen. Right, right. And I, I don't see the government getting an active role in addressing that because mm -hmm. even the housing the non-person with disabilities remain unsolved to this day, and it's just going, becoming worse. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So I have a question. Um, so I'm trying to compare the U.S. and um, the Philippines. I uh, so I guess Tina and Janice, I'm wondering if you could 
and answer this. Um, in the US, is there a requirement to be released back to your family? I know in Singapore, it's kind of like your family has to come and pick you up and sign you out. But I don't know what it's like in the Philippines. Or, I mean, because I think when I was talking with Tina, she was saying that there's less of an emphasis on how you go back and live with your parents or stuff like that. I mean, we d we don't have in the U.S. A, a requirement to be released back to your your parents or your family, but we have the a hospital or institution may not discharge you even if you want to leave if they think that you will have no place to go and you would just go on the street. And and we have we like I was we do have an extensive system of mental health housing that is not really entirely free. I mean free in terms of autonomy and right to not take drugs and that sort of thing. It's really a kind of institution. So but there's no obligation to release people to their family. If that's what you were asking to compare. Yes. And Janice is, I think you said that it wasn't. Yeah. It's more of cultural rather than obligation. It's cultural to have your family around when they release you, because, like I said, they're afraid of liabilities that if they release you on your own, then, then something bad happens to you, goes back to the hospitals. Mm -hmm. So they want family members or whoever to uh, welcome the patient being released. But now with the mental health law, you could self-check out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess in Singapore, it's so partly cultural, but also because of the it's really difficult to buy your own house. I mean, it's very different, but it's really expensive. So people usually live with their families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, Inisha has a question. I was just um, taking it back to uh, when you spoke about uh, decision-making capacity, Janice. Um, yes. Could you elaborate on how that works? Because that is a big issue of, of contention um, uh, yeah. and mental yes. to understand it. Yes, I, I agree. We, we tried very hard uh, for that provision to be placed, but the mental health professionals and legislators prevailed and put it there. Um, it has to be determined by, I mean, me medically. That's what the law says. Hmm. That they, they put out uh, if you can if you can't process the information anymore. And, you know, the, the usual test, functional test. Mm-hmm. So that's what they're gonna use. Um, Janice, you mentioned in your paper that you sent me that um in the past the WHO was um promoting mental health acts as kind of like the state of the art or something that all modern societies should have, but now they've changed it. I'm not sure if that might relate to like some sort of advocacy that people in Nauru could make. So I, I don't know if you could tell us more about that. So the, the, the WHO has been instrumental in a lot of countries' uh, enactment of a mental health law, I mean, including the Philippines way before uh this one although they said uh yeah, with the birth of the crpd they because they have that book uh resource book on mental health uh that has been used by a lot of governments to create their mental health laws and with the uh, with the dawn of the crpd they retracted that and then came up with this quality mental health Quality Rights Initiative, mm -hmm. where they were not condoning involuntary 
I mean, they were, they were condoning involuntary treatment. Yeah, so now it was not driving the south things again. Uh, Janice, I'm wondering, um, what do you think um, the movement in the global north could do to be in solidarity with people in the global south or the movement in the global south? How could the movement be more, you know, like consider every user of the virus or people with psychosocial disability in all parts of the world? Mm -hmm. Uh. Sorry, it's a big question. No, that is a great question. I think it's an important yeah, question. It, it, it's hard for me to, I'm trying not to blur things out because I know that there's a lot of politics going on and I think Tina, would agree with this, what's going on with the movements in the global north and how it's impacting the, the, the efforts being done in the global south. Um, I, 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 I guess I don't really know what you mean by that. So, I mean, I think it would... If you, I, I know that it's hard to talk about, that it's hard to kind of get beyond you know, something that might seem, you know, like, like it would be, well, I don't know. I mean, if there's anything that, that you could share that could help us to get past the sense that there's a division, I, you know, it would be helpful because I would like to see, and I would like to see a movement that, that is able to be composed of the voices of, of everyone where the global South, you know, has its own voice and isn't dominated and that we could see where our commonalities are and where our differences are and, and see how they all relate. Because to me, it does seem like it's one global world and global system and you know, certainly neo-colonialism is a big issue. Um, so I, I don't know if, if there's anything that you could share that could could help us think in a direction of, of how we could um, be in solidarity to build a movement that could, could, could actually say that you know, we're a global movement that, um, you know, we're unified in solidarity as one global movement. How could we get to that point? But, you know, if, if you have anything to share and... Um, what I have observed in my international exposures mm -hmm. is that lens that we talk about, about this neo-colonization is not widely shared. When you talk to them about tech social disability, they don't even know. A lot of the global north are not familiar with the CRPD. They are, they don't know what the disability perspective is when we had the INTAR in India and then the global south contingents are talking of CRPD, CRPD, psychosocial disability, and a lot of the people from the US and Australia, you know, they were what is CRPD? What is what, 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 what we are persons with disability? Uh, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> so one is that identity building. Um, the other is there is still a lot of focus on the, 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 the enemy is the psychiatrist. The enemy is the mental health system. But there is disconnect from what we talked about earlier where the socioeconomic determinants is, is playing a major role. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, that's, 
it's it's good to hear. You know, I think that there's a lot more discussion that's required, but it's it's good to make a start. And um, I think we're 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 we've really we're out of time, and yes. people are going, but. <laughs> Do you have anything anything final that you want to say? Because now we've been in this discussion about the movement and global north, global south. But anything else um, about the, the 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 all of the issues we're talking about? The CRPD, what's necessary in relation to mental health laws, and where you're going in the Philippines from here? So any any last words to to sum up or, you know, leave us with? Um, one of the call to actions that have been put forward in our last plenary at TCI Asia Pacific is the call to align our advocacy with a wider disability movement and the other social movements. You know, the human rights movement because that's that's really missing because if we're doing the fight on our own it will really be hard to prevail um, that's why here uh, like I said earlier it's it's uh, my way forward it's one of the things that I'm gonna do is to make the comrades in the human rights movement and leftist movement be more aware of our plight of the disability paradigm because they'll be they'll really make an impact in advancing our cause when it is seen as, as a call of the people and not just a particular group of people in the way we I see how united the movement is when it's uh, when the sectors all call for a national minimum wage or an ending to mining operations and then you'd see the different sectors and organizations clamoring for the same call and and that's what I'd like to see happening with our disability struggles that the rest of the society would be with us um, in the fight and that will take a lot of efforts but the possibility is there mm -hmm. Sounds, yeah, yeah, that sounds like a really um, beautiful and and great thing to hope for and and to work for. That seems, you know, that seems really possible, um, especially in 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 the Philippines, given the way that the movement exists there and that there is a strong human rights movement of society in general. So, so that's, um, it's, it's really great to see how some of the work done in, in particular countries is, 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 is capable of showing a way forward for everybody. And, and I wish you a lot of, um, success in that. So thank you. I, yeah, I'd like to close here and remind everybody that the next um, the next discussion we're having on November twentieth is going to be with Alberto Vasquez from Peru, <laughs> who is also yes. showing a way forward um, for the movement. And thank yes. you, thank you, Janice. Thank you very much for being here with us today and for all for all the knowledge and information you've been sharing um, and, and, and a lot of challenges to, to us as well as a movement. So thank you very much. Um, you know, hopefully you will maybe join us again sometime if, if, if we create the same kind of format. And it's been great to hear from you and get to know your work a little better. You're most welcome. It has been a privilege. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. I know, I know that you're part of the Philippine struggle because you're one of the consultants that I always go to. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I'm going to, to end now. And good
Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for your participation today. Um, see you.